All right, so now we're going to talk about quality control and normalization. It's another very exciting topic, uh, but it can make or break your experiment. If you do it wrong, all of your results later on will also be wrong. All right, so this is the overall workflow for your analysis of your single cell RNA-seq experiment. So first you'll normalize the expression, then you'll do feature selection and dimensionality reduction to get rid of as much noise as possible in your single cell experiment. Then you'll calculate cell cell distances, convert that to a key nearest neighbor graph and do clustering or trajectory inference, and then do differential expression, either between conditions or between clusters or across your trajectory, depending on what you're interested in. So obviously if you make a mistake at the front at the start, everything downstream will be full of errors as well. So quality control, the purpose is to remove dead or damaged cells from our data set. So there's lots of ways for cells to die. They have necrosis from being damaged in our handling. They can become stressed and trigger apoptosis, or uh, they can just straight up be sheared in half while we're uh, trying to dissociate our tissue. So how can we measure cell quality? Once we get our sequencing data, that's all we have anymore. We can't look at our cells. We can't do any assays on our cells. All we have is our UMI count matrix and our, our mapping statistics, essentially. So this is all we have to go on to estimate the cell quality. So how can we do this? So there's lots of different things we could calculate. So does anyone have any suggestions for a metric we could use to estimate cell quality? Yeah. Yeah, number of genes we detect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, number of UMIs per cell. No other suggestions, well. All right, so there's lots of other ones that I'll show you in a moment. And then we're gonna to need to figure out which ones are best. Uh, so you may have heard sort of logical reasoned arguments why we use certain statistics for quality control, uh, but they're all invented after the fact. How we actually decided what quality control to use was back in the day, we did an experiment to figure out which ones work. So we're gonna go all the way back to 2014, which is, I know, ages ago ancient history uh, by single cell standards, where we had the cutting edge technology was the fluidime C1, which looks like this. So we have these fancy microfluidic devices that let us capture a single cell. And the advantage here is that we can actually image these plates and see what our cell looks like. So we can actually look to see if it looks damaged or dead, or if it looks alive and intact. So that's what we did or we didn't, uh, one of my friends, Thomas, uh, did this when I was doing my postdoc and uh, gathered a whole bunch of data, looked at all of these cells, classified them as dead or damaged or alive, then calculated every statistic he could think of. So expression of apoptosis-related genes, housekeeping genes, cytoplasmic versus membrane genes, ribosomal genes, mitochondrial genes, metabolism, looked at mapping statistics, a whole bunch of different mapping statistics, and looking at how many highly variable genes we found, uh, looking at the variance of the transcriptome across different cells, looking at number of lowly expressed genes, uh, total reads, number of detected genes, everything he could think of, and then looked at whether they could be used to predict whether the cell was damaged or not. And out of all of these, it came down to two. So for identifying whether a cell was broken or damaged, mitochondrial percentage was by far the best statistic. And for looking at whether a uh, capture site actually found an, a cell or not, the number of detected genes was by far the best statistic. And from then on, that's what everyone did and all, our, all of our pipelines use. 
And uh, in the lab, you'll actually learn how to set the thresholds yourself for how to filter based on those two statistics. So once we've done our QC, now we need to do normalization. And the reason we do normalization is because of the library size problem. So if we have this single cell RNA-seq experiment where we've sequen sequenced three, um, 372 million reads across our data, we'll get a certain number of reads detected per cell and UMIs per cell and genes detected per cell. But if we assume by, that sequencing is just by chance, what would happen if we doubled or quadrupled the amount of sequencing we did? Would we get more genes detected per cell, more UMIs detected per cell? Yeah. So the, the number of genes or reads we see per cell is determined by our choice of sequencing. It's not a fundamental property of, a, of our biological system. And then if we looked within this experiment, if we compared the blue cell to the red cell, and the blue cell has more than twice as many UMIs in it than the blue cell does. So if we looked at the difference in the expression between those two cells for any particular gene, the blue cell will have twice as many UMIs than the red cell. And we don't care about that. We don't want to know that, oh, this cluster has twice as much expression because we just sequenced it more. That's not interesting. So we want to get rid of this effect. So the easiest way to do this is counts per million. So here we simply, and million is in quotation marks because it's not really a million for us. So here we take each cell, we divide by the total number of UMIs in that cell, so we have essentially the percentage of expression for each of our genes in that cell. And then we multiply by 10,000 or some other number just to make it so we're looking at like normal integer numbers rather than 0 0.0001 and 0 0.000005, right? That, those are annoying to look at and to deal with. So we just multiply it by a big number to make those look normal. However, this raises the problem of proportionality. So if we have this experiment, uh, so we have this cell where we've got uh, these seven genes and they make up this percentage of the total RNA in that cell. If we then take that gene A and we increase its expression by tenfold, but we keep all of the other genes the same, then yes, we can see that the total percent of RNA that that gene makes up increases. But if we compare the other genes, it looks like they all decrease when they haven't. They've stayed exactly the same. So that's, that's not ideal. So we want to come up with a solution to that problem. Fortunately, uh, as you, if you did the bulk RNA-seq course, you probably learned about this. This is also a problem in bulk RNA-seq. So they've come up with some solutions. So there they assume that most genes are not strongly differentially expressed between cells. It might be worth considering whether that's true for single cell. If you look at a T cell and an epithelial cell, it might not be true that most of those genes are not differentially expressed between them. But if you assume this assumption still holds for single cell, then you could use DSeq, right? It calculates the mean relative expression versus geometric mean per gene, or you could use trimmed M values from a jar. However, both of these methods were designed for bulk RNA-seq, where we don't have any zeros. Right? All of our genes are detected in all of our samples. If you try to calculate these on samples with lots of zeros, they completely fail. So they don't work for single cell. So instead, what we came up with was SCRAN. So SCRAN takes a bunch of cells, pools them together, so now they look like bulk RNA-seq, and then calculates either DSeq2 or trimmed M, M values on that pool, do that a whole bunch of different times with different combinations of cells, and then you can use uh, algebra to separate all of those randomly generated pools and their appropriate size uh, normalization factors back out into single cell normalization factors. 
So that solved the proportionality problem. However, then more recently, people discovered that not all genes behave the same under normalization. So both of those, all of those methods create one normalization factor for each cell and then divide all of the genes by that factor. But when uh, people looked at this and looked at genes of different expression levels, when you did uh, log normalized expression of genes of different expression levels, some of them behaved well and some of them didn't. So here, the group one is the most highly expressed genes. Then we have the second most and the third most highly expressed genes all the way down to the least low, most lowly expressed genes. So you see the lowly expressed genes, they behave pretty well. So the x-axis here is the total counts per cell. So we want to see a flat line. So the, the expression of our genes shouldn't depend on the total counts per cell. So the lowly expressed genes behaved well, but the more highly expressed genes did not. So we had to come up with another solution. So rather than trying to do one size factor for each cell, for each cell, uh, we came up with SC transform, or at least the, the people over at Surat did. And here, what they do is they bin genes by their expression level. Right? So we saw different expression levels behave differently. Randomly select some genes from each bin that we're going to fit a model to. We then fit a negative binomial regression model versus the sequencing depth and the, for the observed expression. So for each gene, we do observed expression versus sequencing depth. And we actually just fit what that relationship is. And then we remove that relationship. Right? We just calculate the residuals to that linear regression. And once they fit those parameters, they extrapolate to the other genes in that bin. Right? Genes with the same expression level behave basically the same. And instead of calculating regular residuals, right, where you just take the observed minus the fitted value, they calculate Pearson residuals. So this is the equation for Pearson residuals. So we have our observed data minus our expectation, given our model, divided by the square root of the variance of, the, of our model. Right? And we do that, right? So here's the correlation with total EOMIs per cell of genes of different expression levels. So with our log normalized expression, we get this weird pattern where some of them are quite correlated. When we do Pearson residuals, that correlation is completely gone. Right? So we fixed our normalization problem. And what's, what's also nice about this is because we're doing a regression model, right? we could add other things to that regression. So if we wanted to get rid of the effect of mitochondrial RNA, we could just add that to our regression model. If we want to get rid of the effects of, batch, of batches, we could add that to our model. If we want to get rid of the effect of cell cycle, you could add that to a model. You can add whatever you want. All right, so that's one purpose of normalization. The other purpose of normalization, so you notice I talked about log normalized data. The purpose of the log is for this part of normalization. So the other goal of normalization is to make our data follow a normal distribution. Right, lots of tools like the t-test, PCA, lots of regression models assume our data follows a normal distribution. Single cell RNA-seq data does not follow a normal distribution unless we manipulate it. So UMI counts, they follow a negative binomial distribution. But if we log transform it, now it looks pretty close to a normal distribution. And we've got a nice, nice little hump there. Sure, we've got this big spike at zero, but the rest of the values are pretty normally distributed. We can also do Pearson residuals, and you can see that also makes it somewhat normally distributed. So once we've done either of those, we can now do PCA or any other statistical method we want that assumes a normal distribution. All right, so those are our, our normalization problems found in every data set. But depending on the data set, there might be other confounders we want to get rid of. So I've 
differentiated confounder versus normalization problem, as confounders are biological differences. So they're real biological signals, but we just don't care about them. So some of the examples of this are the cell cycle, the genetic background of different individuals, tissue storage. So we've got frozen versus not frozen samples or samples that have been stored for three months and others that have been stored for a week. Environmental or lifestyle factors, age or data processing, circadian rhythm stuff, or stuff like st cell stress. Right? Most of the time, we don't actually care what these are doing in our data. So we'd prefer to just get rid of them. There's a bunch of different possible solutions. So you could just design your experiments to get rid of them so that they're not a problem. Um, sometimes that's possible, sometimes that's not. So I would say genetic background, if you're using patient samples, you can't pick a bunch of genetically identical humans. They just don't exist. You can also use a regression model to remove it, which I, I briefly mentioned. You can exclude the cells or genes that are most affected by it. So that's often what's used for cell stress. You see a bunch that, of cells that have really high stress signature, you can just throw them out, ignore, and uh, remove them from your data set. You can include that covariate in differential ex expression models or other models you're fitting to the data. Or what lots of people actually end up doing is just ignoring it and hoping the biological signal you're interested in is stronger than that confounder. So often things like circadian rhythm, tissue storage, age or data processing, we just ignore it and hope it's not a problem. Is that right? Probably not, but what can you do? All right. So when talking about the cell cycle, it actually gets a bit more complicated because intuitively we might say, oh, we don't care about the cell cycle, we should regress it. But when you regress something using statistics, you don't just regress out that one thing. You'll also regress out anything that's correlated with that thing. So an important case study here is if you're looking at cancer, Right? You might care about differences between cells that are actively cycling in the cell cycle and actively proliferating and cells that aren't actively pro proliferating. But if you regress at the cell cycle, you'll also remove all of those differences. So here, if you're looking at development or differentiation, here the cell cycle might be a confounder and you might want to remove it, regress it out. But if you're looking at mature tissue, Usually your cells won't be cycling. So you, this is mostly a non-issue. But if you're looking at cancer, it's often biologically interesting why and how fast different cells are cycling and others are not. So you have to sort of use your understanding of your system to decide whether you should or shouldn't remove these different factors. It's not a one size fits all for a single cell. And the last thing that often gets brought up, but hopefully is less so these days, is imputing data, imputing and smoothing data. So because we have single cell RNA-seq where 95% of our matrix is zeros, most of our genes are detected in less than 10% of the cells, it's very tempting to say, well, why don't I just get rid of those zeros by imputing the, the zeros and fitting the best actual number to that zero instead of leaving it as a zero. Or because we have very noisy data, hey, why don't we just smooth it and get rid of some of that noise? However, here I did a little experiment where uh, just a toy simulated data where half of the genes were differentially expressed. So they're in red and blue here. These are the correlations between the genes. So you can see all the red genes are correlated with each other. All the blue genes are correlated with each other and they're different in opposite directions. And then I have a bunch of genes that aren't differentially expressed. So there's no signal in those genes at all. They're just random noise. And then I ran imputation on them. And you see all of the imputation methods, suddenly all the genes that aren't correlated with each other become correlated with each other. For no reason, right? These genes, there's no actual signal there, but now there is. Um, so this is a big problem. So if you impute 
or smooth your data, you can no longer run a statistical test on that data. You will get a ton of false positives. But you can still use it to make your plots look amazingly good, if you want. Uh, just know you cannot run any statistical test on it. Any questions? All right. And to summarize, we talked about QC, where we can use low genes detected per cell to identify dead cells and high mitochond percent mitochondrial to identify damaged cells. Talked about normalization, how it's necessary, even though it's not very interesting. And that bulk RNA-seq normalization doesn't work for single cell. We can use pooling or model-based normalization instead. There are many potential bio biological confounders. How you deal with them will depend on your experiment and your question of interest. Sometimes you can fix them, sometimes you can't, and you just have to hope they're not going to be a problem. And if you're going to do imputation, do not run statistical tests on it, on your imputed data. 